Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sam Yebri, co-founder and president of 30 Years After. On behalf of the founders, supporters, and volunteers of 30 Years After, good morning, sobecher, and beruchim habayim. It is that unique juxtaposition of heritage that makes this event so unique. 30 years ago, a community of Jews fled Iran amid the turmoil of a revolution. Thousands of those Jews came to the United States and began new lives, benefiting from every opportunity that this great nation affords. Now, after 30 years, something special is happening in that community. A generation of Iranian Jews raised and educated in the United States is finding great strength in their heritage and in their history. In that heritage and in that history, they're also finding great responsibility. Responsibility to better the community in which they live and to serve the Jewish people and the Jewish homeland. It is this responsibility that is a topic of our morning session, entitled Civic Action as a Jewish Imperative. Before we commence our distinguished uh, session, I kindly ask you to please turn off all cell phones and to help us begin and end all sessions on time. Ladies and gentlemen, today will be a demanding and grueling day. We carefully chose four panels on local, national, Iranian, and Israeli issues. We purposefully brought together 40 different Jewish organizations and 30 national and international leaders from around the world to help educate, inspire, and empower the entire Jewish community. Simply put, we are here because there is work to be done. But first, we believe that the mission of this conference, to promote the participation of Iranian Jews in American civic, political, and Jewish affairs, requires that we begin by exploring the Jewish values that inform our community. Our first distinguished speaker is a spiritual leader of the Iranian Jewish community and head rabbi at Nesach Israel Synagogue, Rabbi David Shofet. Since emigrating to the United States in 1980, Rabbi Shofet has helped our community maintain its Jewish values and Jewish traditions in this country. He and his late father, Rabbi Chacham Yadidia, of blessed memory, built Nesach Synagogue into one of the largest and most prominent synagogues in the United States. Rabbi Shofet's wise counsel and wisdom are sought by every member of our community when it is most needed. Today is no exception. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi David Shofet. No, I'm not going to speak in Hebrew. Um, before I start my south, I was sitting on the panel looking at distinguished member of the panel, Mr. Prager, Rabbi Feinstein, and my dear friend, Dr. Bravarian. I got very excited and uh, a little nervous, but not because of the panel's member. Because I look at that sign 30 years after. I was thinking about 30 years after this historical moment, when the next generation of Iranian immigrants are looking at this day, this Sunday, they will be proud of us, of every member of 30 years after. I bless you and continue to your 
beautiful work. I would like to congratulate all the active members of 30 years later for their vision and aspirations, the right decisions, and the determination to open a new avenue towards the integration of the second generation of Iranian Jewish immigrants in the mainstream of America's political realm. For us, the first generation of immigrants who lived and were educated in Iran, the concept of involvement in politics, election, and voting freely is very new and somehow alien to us. To explain myself, I have to show you the contrast between the political system in Iran and democratic system of the West, especially in the United States. In the time of the Shah, any group with any kind of political ideology was not permitted to be active or to convene for any political purpose. There was only one legitimate party, the party of the Shah. We, the Jews, had a little more privilege. Our students were allowed to form their own political organization, but only outside the university campus and not within. The activities of the Jewish student organization were more cultural and religious. They rarely had the courage to have lectures about Israel or other political issues because they were usually under the surveillance of the secret police and every single word and action was recorded by them. The parents of the students always advised them not to get involved in politics. They reasoned that Jews as a minority were very vulnerable and had to remain loyal to the existing political system. In other words, conformist. But surpri surprising enough, some Jewish students were active members of some underground political organizations with leftist ideologies. Two years after the revolution, I eulogized a very young Jewish student in her early 20s in Los Angeles. She was a member of Fadayan Khal, an extreme leftist organization, and was killed in a fight against revolutionary guards of Khomeini. She she carried arms and she fought. I assume that she was not an exceptional case. There were other Jewish Iranian youth who were politically active. When it became obvious that the regime of Shah was about to collapse, the members of the Central Jewish Community of Iran which was the umbrella organization of Iranian Jews, started to find a way to make contact with Khomeini in France in order to gain some means of protection. The central Jewish community could not do it openly. Therefore, with this approval, the representative of the Jew Jewish group that called itself intellectual group, Roshan Fekran, went to France to meet and met with Khomeini. They got assurances that in the case of a regime change, the Jews would be safe. Ironically, most of the members of the intellectual group were ex-communists. But I emphasize that their initiation and action were correct and life-saving. However, the revolution brought us more hatred, restrictions, uncertainty, and enmity from some leaders of the new regime. Therefore, we had to readapt ourselves to a completely new political environment. I remember the last month of Shah's regime. 
For more than three decades, my father, Zichanori Vacha, blessed memory, Chacham Bididia Shofet, used to go to Shah's palace on Iranian New Year and, and the Shah's birthday in order to congratulate and bless the king. On the last birthday celebration of the Shah, my father went to the palace as usual, along with other prominent members of the Jewish community. He blessed the Shah and bluntly asked him not to leave the country. A few months later, when Shah left Iran, my father was forced to take part in a huge rally of Muslim supporters of Khomeini. I remember every moment of this event. He walked in front of a thousand Jewish men and women. The group carried banners and shouted slogans of unity and support for the Khomeini. These cases show us why in Iran we were not interested to be active politically. However, the situation in this blessed country and land, the cradle of democracy, is totally different. Your political beliefs and philosophy is respected. Your individual voice and vote is heard and accounted for. You declare your convictions, ideologies, and religion without fear of jail or death. The most important factor in your political activities is that you are able to support Israel, the country and the land that is the neshama, the soul of the Jewish nation in the diaspora. But please be careful. Do not substitute Israel with the Jewish religion and tradition. The price that we are going to pay for our acceptance and equality must not come at the expense of our identity and future as Jews. I would like to finish my words with a quotation from Chief Rabbi of England, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his address to the Lameth Conference. His audience was made of many clergymen. I quote, we are living through one of the most faithful age of change since Homo sapiens first set foot on Earth. Globalization and new information technologies are doing two things simultaneously. First, they are fragmenting our world. Narrow casting is taking the place of broadcasting. National cultures are growing weaker. We are splitting into ever smaller sects of the like-minded." I hope that this new group will bring our community more unity and coherence and less division. I also hope that this will prepare our future generations to be part of the bigger Jewish community and at the same time not only to be politically active but to observe and preserve our Jewish traditions that our ancestors kept for 27 centuries in Iran. Thank you for listening. Todaraba. Hello, my name is Rona Ram. I am inspired to be here among you this morning. I remember when I first heard Dennis Prager's show, nearly seven years ago. An African-American gentleman had called in. It was the 4th of July, and he had called to say that because of Dennis and the love for Judaism and the nation of Israel, he was inspired, inspired to put up an Israeli flag that day along with his American flag. I remember it was that night, I went back to my dorm room at UCLA and I emailed him desperately. I looked up his email address and I said, hi, you don't know me, Dennis, I don't know if this sounds familiar. <laughs> but I said, I will do anything, I'll mop your floors, I'll clean your windows, I just want to work for you and see how it is you do what you do. Lucky for me, the next morning, 
I got a special phone call. I guess he needed his windows cleaned. <laughs> and the voice sounded too familiar. I nearly dropped to the ground, and uh, from then on, my life had really changed, working for this incredible man. The most important and powerful lesson that I got from learning, from working with Dennis, has been the power that one person can have. And this is a theme that I hope we all keep with us as we go through this monumental day. We all think of ourselves as just one person. I know as I called a lot of you to give sell tickets to this event, you said, Rona, I'm just one person. What's the big deal if I'm there? You know, you have so many people coming. It's just me, one person. What's the big deal if I vote? What's the big deal if I stand up to somebody who made an anti-Israel remark? I'm just one person. Today, we're all here to tell you something Dennis has exemplified to all of us. Look around you. It is, in fact, a big deal. You being here is a big deal. The power one voice can have, as Mr. Dennis Prager has so eloquently showed us and continues to do so every morning, is a big deal. Our community, to have one voice as an Iranian Jewish American community, is indeed a very big deal. With millions of listeners around the world, through his radio show, syndicated in over 70 cities, which we here in LA can hear at 8.70 a.m., from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. every day, including his books, best-selling books, including Happiness is a Serious Problem, his endless articles, lectures, and even a class he teaches at the University of Judaism, all information available at PragerRadio.com. This one man has revolutionized the concept of morality, of the Jewish contribution to morality around the nation, of our moral imperative to fight evil, to be good, even to live a happy life. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it is my moral honor and true pleasure to introduce to you this tremendous man, exemplary role model, and how big of a deal it truly is for all of us to be here today and to continue to have an impact. Thank you. I have to tell you that, and I mean this sincerely, that if, if I ever have moments of wondering if I've made you, good use of my life, to know that I've touched the person of the quality of Rona Ram is sufficient for me to believe that I haven't wasted my time. This is a remarkable, remarkable young woman. She's a credit to your community, and I am uh, very touched that she feels the way she does about me. Rabbi Shofet, Rabbi Feinstein, Dr. Baravarian, ladies and gentlemen, I have a time limit and I'm checking and I will keep to it, so I have to get very much into my talk. I have very important things, I think anyway, I hope you will think, to say to you, and very different from what you might expect, and perhaps different from what some other speakers uh, will be saying. But first, let me just tell you, for those of you who don't know, and many of you do know, I have a special affection and affinity for the Iranian Jewish community to the point where I have been dubbed Daryush Pregarzadeh, <laughs> a title that I carry with great honor and, and joy. Uh, I, I, I've, I can't trace my family tree very far back as it happens, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some Prager in is Isfahan at some time in history, because it doesn't make sense how much affinity this Brooklyn Jew has with you, but we do. And it's a big, uh, it's a big joy uh, in my life. So thank you again for having me. Talking to you now about your at civic action, I am going to give you, if you have to leave in one minute, here is the essence of my message. You've heard the American saying, a practice what you preach, correct? This, I would ask you, you Persian Jewish, American Jews, Persian Jews, I would ask you to preach what you practice. If I had to summarize in a nutshell what I would like you to do to make a better world, 
to fight for Israel, to, to fight against the Iranian regime, and to fight for America. You have a three-pronged uh, goal, and I will talk about that in a moment, too. How do you balance all three? That is my advice to you. Preach what you practice. You are not known as a minority. We have a very bizarre definition in America of minority. It generally means though, not those who are statistically in a minority, but those who are statistically in a minority and are troubled and have not been as an entire community particularly successful in whatever definition to success you wish to give. I'm being utterly honest. Honesty is the only way we'll make a better country. You have, you are a very small minority and you have succeeded amazingly. I stand outside of you and inside of you and outside of you and I am, I am not alone at all. And I look at what you have accomplished, people coming over here from a different culture, I mean very different culture, that you didn't come here from another Western country. Coming here from an utterly different culture, very often very little money, very often no knowledge of the English language, perhaps not even of the Latin alphabet, and then in one generation become one of the most successful communities in the United States of America. Do you now understand why I want you to preach what you practice? Maybe you have models for other minorities in this country that if followed would enable them to do it. It isn't genes. You don't have some Persian Jewish gene that, that enabled you to succeed. You have Persian Jewish values that enabled you to succeed. You need to preach those values. And if you don't know them, and you may not know them, because they may be so habitual that you may not know them. That's very common in life where people do the right thing or the wrong thing and don't know what they're doing because it's habit. So let me tell you as an outsider, as it were, some of the things that you do that are the keys to success for other American minorities. I want you to see yourself, you, you may not have, as teachers. I think the best thing you can do is teach. In a humble way, look, we came here, we are small, we didn't have anything extra, we were not given any government handout, and we met the American dream well beyond it in one generation for the most part. Well, what is it that we did, and are our values universalizable? And the answer is, yes, they are, in no order of importance. Strong families. The emphasis in your community on the family is, is profound. First, have a family, <laughs> which is being lost in the Western world. Italy is not reproducing. Russia, which is semi-Western, is not reproducing. Russia, Russia will lose almost half its population in the next century. Italy will lose about 30%, 40% of its population in the next 50 years. And in, the, in, in America as well, a lot of groups, as they get more affluent and certainly more secular, they don't make babies. It's much more fun to eat out frequently than it is to, to uh, burp a baby. And so a lot of couples just decide that they rather eat out often and take uh, trips than to raise children. You decided that raising children is a pretty important thing. Making a family and having a strong family life, and by strong family life, you also have the extended family, as I know. You know, I mean, you know what it's like to attend any, any Persian family event. It's, they're done at the Rose Bowl. I mean, you know, it's, it's, and, that, and that doesn't include all the family. You still had to exclude certain members. This is a very powerful thing to teach. Than, and it is exactly that arena that, that afflicts some of the minorities that are, not, that are not succeeding in America. Preach your commitment to strong community, community institutions. You created, as soon as you were, arrived here, strong communal institutions. Not every Persian Jew is, ha, has it easy. 
You helped each other. There's a great saying in the Talmud, kodmim. How do you know which poor to give first to? There are poor all over the world. The Talmud says you give to the poor of your own village first or your own city first. It is okay that you help one another. It is not only okay, it is a good model. And you don't only help each other. Obviously, you help the larger communities, you help Israel, you help America. But it is, you don't have to defend the fact that you also help each other. Mormons help each other. They are regarded by the rest of America as a model. It's not resented. And, and Jews generally are regarded as a model in this way about helping each other. It's a good thing that we do. I, I started in Jewish life and in public life at the age of 21 when I was fighting for Soviet Jewry. I was sent by Israel to the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union of my knowledge of Russian and Hebrew. I spent a month there. I came back and, that's, and, I, and I just spoke on Soviet Jewry virtually every day of the week. And I remember something very significant during the Soviet Jewry struggle, which precedes a lot of your coming here. But some of you may recall this as well. Every synagogue in America, Nashville, Tennessee, Los Angeles, California, New York, anywhere, had a sign on it, Save Soviet Jewry. And I, as, as many of you know, if you hear me on the radio, I, have, I adore America's Christians. I adore them. Uh, they have made a spectacular, u uniquely wonderful country. But it's an interesting thing. Though Soviet Christians were more persecuted, more than Soviet Jews, I never saw a church in America with save Soviet Christians. This sense that we had of commitment to fellow Jews was a very good model. Your model of helping fellow Persian Jews is a good model to other minorities. Among other things, and this is politically incorrect to say, it meant you didn't look to others to help yourselves. That's one of the biggest secrets to success. Don't look to the government. Don't look to the state. Help yourselves. This is what you did. It is a major secret to your success that others need to learn from you. Number three. You have a deep love for America. Almost every July 4th, I celebrate with Persian Jews, right? Right, the Nuremids make this event, is that correct? And, and so many of you attend that. Well, it's all actually only their cousins, but nevertheless, it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, it's just part of my joke about how big your families are. Because whenever I see any two of you, oh yeah, that's my cousin. I go, how many cousins can one human being have? It's just... It's, it's, it defies rational explanation. I, don't know. I have three cousins, and I, you know, that's it. You know. Anyway, uh, it's uh, this the love of America that I hear expressed in Persian Jewish life is very significant, and a minority that doesn't love America isn't going to succeed in America. It should be self-definitional, but it isn't. You do, and that's a beautiful thing, and it should be cultivated. I will talk about all the different loyalties you have and how none of them are mutually exclusive in a moment. You do not look to government for solutions. You, you worked for, with yourselves. And I'll tell you another thing that you can teach others. I know you've had, you have a distinguished uh, mayor of a Persian Jewish uh, uh, descent in Beverly Hills, and that's wonderful. Something to be proud of, no question about it. But you have not done what, for example, black Americans have done. They have, they have too much associated success in America with having uh, African Americans in Congress and in political power. It doesn't mean a thing to have a lot of black congressmen, senators, well, they don't have black senators right now, unfortunately, or governors or, or certainly mayors. It doesn't matter. The most successful ethnic group in the United States tend to come from Asian groups. There is no Asian political power, none. Can you name a Japanese American congressman or senator or governor or mayor? Can you name a Chinese American governor or senator or mayor? No. It's all, it's all a shimmer, it's all a mirage that this helps you. There are no Persian Jewish congressmen and senators that I am aware of at any rate. It doesn't matter. It means nothing, nothing. 
What matters is, as Rona said and, and others have said here, one by one by one, that's how you make a powerful community, not through quote unquote political power. There's no Persian caucus in the Congress. You seem to have done rather well without one. You have to teach America about the nature of the Iranian regime. Who knows Ahmadinejad and that mentality as you do? No one, no one. You need to teach Americans who tend to be naive, who tend not to understand evil. You know evil, you many cases left it or know or have some relatives or friends still back there, but in any event know it. These people, these Ayatollahs and these Ahmadinejads, these are really evil people. It's not just one small country that might get nuclear weapons. This is a frightening country that might get nuclear weapons. No one knows that like you do. We Americans generally meaning, we need to hear your experience, your insight. Perhaps, I, I know there's so many things you can do. Uh, uh, have a constant stream like memory does uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of television and radio broadcasts and articles from the Islamic world. You should have permanent translation services. I, 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 it's just off the top of my head. Go around to public schools. They love to have immigrants come over. Go to public schools all over the, the Southern California and everywhere else in America. And just say, I'd like to tell you about the place I left. They can't charge you with racism. <laughs> You're Persian. It's a charge people make because they have no answer to the, to the charge that there really are evil people running that government. In, in this regard, here's something you might want to have that would be very moving. I remember when there was a, a demonstration uh, with, reg from, uh, with regard to Latino immigrants. Uh, and uh, remember, it, it was a, a very, um, it, was a, it had a very mixed reception among American, Americans in general because there were so many Mexican flags, more than American flags, at that particular, uh, at that particular rally. And it, it, it hurt their cause. Uh, and, and they know it, by the way. The organizers ha have learned their lesson, I think. But it would be a very beautiful thing for you to organize a, as large a rally as you can, as you could, thank you America. Nobody thanks America. Everybody demands of America, but organized thanks, we don't see. Do you know what a Kiddush Hashem that would be? Of, of specifically Jews organizing to say thank you America? If you, if you booked, I don't know, some major stadium or, or some major area and just said the, there's only one purpose that we have. We came here as immigrants in the last generation and you have given us the opportunity to have everything. We want to thank you. It would be an awesome moment, an awesome moment uh, in American history. Nobody thanks this country. Either people thank it privately or they complain publicly. But it would be just something to, to give you a thought about another thing you can do. Now let me just address one more thing because time is, uh, t time is nearing. The time that I was allotted is, is coming to an end. And I want to just share with you, you have a number of commitments to Iranian Jewish culture, to America and its values, and to Israel and the Jewish people. They are not at all mutually contradictory. Let me read to you from your own guide here, your civic action guide. You say, how do we support our nation? You have a unique dilemma for our community. How do we support our nation, the United States, protect the center of our faith, Israel, and preserve our ties to our ethnic homeland, Iran, all at once? Well, it is unique because of the Iranian dimension, but it's not unique, multiple multiple concerns and even loyalties are, are just fine in America. It's just fine. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you right now, I am asked on the radio, I am asked by Jews, I am asked by non-Jews regularly. And, and not, not done in a, in a spirit of animosity, just curious. Dennis, you're so, 
you're a committed Jew and you're, you're obviously such a committed American. So tell me, what are you first, an American or a Jew? And I will tell you the answer I give Jews, non-Jews, and uh, Martians. Anybody who asks me the question, I say, I have two fathers, Avraham, Abraham, and George Washington. And I'm fine. And that, by the way, it's not a diplomatic answer. That is exactly what I believe. I, it's not only not a problem of dual loyalties, it's an enrichment of my life to be the child of George Washington and Avraham Avinu. It's not, it is no problem at all. On the contrary, the founders of this country worshipped and wanted the God of Israel to be the central piece of the American value system. You are in a country that loves your religion my religion, our religion, our God. You want, to, you want an unwavering commitment to a secure Israel and to a free Iran. Well, shockingly, they are quite related. When Iran is free, Iran will no longer threaten Israel. The freedom in Iran is the most important single issue on earth at this moment, in my opinion. That's, that's how positive and pa profound a role and task you might have. Iran with nuclear weapons could lead to uh, an Armageddon-like world. You know it, everyone knows it. You have a unique capacity being from there and being here to, to explain and to work for a freer Iran. And God knows I wish you Godspeed in that effort because Israel needs it, we need it, everybody needs it. You balance a lot of things as Iranian Jews and you do a pretty good job. I know that there are inner tensions. I don't romanticize your lives. I know that. Who should my, my child marry? Should it be an Ashkenazi Jew, or a Sephardi Jew, a Persian Jew? I know that. I know, I know what goes on. I, don't, it's a, I know the, all the dilemmas you want on the one hand to perpetuate Iranian Jewish culture, which is so unique and so rich. And on the other hand, you're part of the larger Jewish community and you're not living in Iran. And your daughter may very well likely fall in love with a Feinstein. And, uh, I have two sons. <laughs> See, there you are. <laughs> we didn't, you see, we didn't even discuss this, and I knew I would get a positive response. I mean, that's, that's just, it, it, there's a certain inevitability to that. I was discussing this with some, with some of you earlier uh, about the marriage issue, and I, so I know these tensions. I know them. And, and they're inevitable. You are in a country of such fluidity and freedom, it's just inevitable. But it's okay, it is okay. Life without tension is the life of a cow. And I don't aspire to be a cow, I aspire to be a human and we have tensions. You've done a magnificent job. You, the very fact that you would convene, convene this, remember, today isn't what can you do for, what can you America do for us? Just this very day, I conclude with this, just this very day is a statement of you. You're having a whole day, what can we Persian Jews do for you? You embody John F. Kennedy's message, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I am proud to be Daryush Pregerzadeh. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Diana Massaband, and I'm a 30 years after a board member. As a young woman just beginning to take action and get involved in the Persian American Jewish community, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Shokrola Beravarian is a longtime leader in the Iranian American Jewish community. Dr. Beravarian has served as chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Magvit Foundation. President of the Iranian Friends of City of Hope, 
Chairman of the Executive Board of the Iranian American Jewish Federation and President of the Iranian American Jewish Federation. In 2005, Dr. Baravarian received the Finance Services Award of the Southern California Israel Chamber of Commerce. In 2006, Dr. Baravarian was a recipient of the Song of Zion Award from the Israel Christian Nexus. Please help me welcome Dr. Shokrola Baravarian. Thank you, Diana Negin Masaband, for the introduction. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. After fascinating speech of Dennis Prager, a radio talk show host, author, documentary filmmaker and one of America's most respected opinion makers, how am I going to express myself easily? However, firstly, simply, I want to say that how extremely proud and honored I am for having been invited to speak for a few minutes at this magnificent and graceful gathering. So, let it be my first pleasant duty to express my gratitude and gratefulness to the 30 years after board in general and Ms. Jasmine Oberman in particular for this invitation. Secondly, after I learned how and why in November 2007, 30 years after was created, I thought that this historic decision and undertaking taking, will prove this organization can and will become one of the most successful, respectful, and meaningful organizations of the Iranian Jewish community all over America, provided that all that you have achieved and decided will be followed with unity, perseverance, and sacrifice, along with the benefiting from support and experiences of respected Jewish organizations such as American Jewish Committee, American Jewish Federation, Iranian American Jewish Federation, where I served as president for two terms totaling four years, Israel Christian Nexus, Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles, Magbit Foundation and B'nai B'rith and very many other important foundations and Jewish organizations. I am indeed very proud of what our young generation have decided to exhibit and the challenges they are going to encounter. It is very gratifying that they have started it because once Sir Winston Churchill said, civilization will not last, freedom will not survive, peace will not be kept unless a very large majority of mankind unite to, to, together to defend them. Congra congratulations to the unity and solidarity of 30 years later after. The younger generation of the Iranian Jewish community in the United States of America stands taller than any other younger generation of 
immigrants in the last two centuries of American history. This is based on highest level of education, successful professionalism, and accumulation of wealth. You have worked very hard, and you have proven to be extremely far-sighted. Your success in all walks of life in the coming decade is guaranteed. You know, on the Holocaust, six million Jews were brutally and systematically murdered over a period of 12 years, from 1933 to 1945, because almost nothing was done by Jewish leadership to stop it. What you are saying, by means of your plans and actions, to be taken means never, never again. <laughs> Lastly, I want to say that exactly two years ago, on September 14, 2006, I was honored by Israel Christian Nexus and was recipient of Song of Zion Award. I was really thrilled and extremely delighted, and so am I today, having had the honor and pleasure to address you for these few minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Nicole Farnoosh, and as a member of 30 Years After, I'm honored to be here this morning. Rabbi Edward Feinstein is Rabbi of Valley of Shalom, and lecture in the Ziegler Rabbinical School at the American Jewish University. He serves on the faculty of the Wexner Heritage Foundation and the Shalom Harman Institute in the Jerusalem and on the board of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. Being a member of Valley Beth Shalom for the past 14 years, I've had the privilege of knowing the rabbi personally, his wife Nina, and his beautiful children. Rabbi Feinstein has not only become a close family friend, but a great supporter of the Persian community amongst others. A decade ago, I was blessed to have him as the rabbi at my bat mitzvah, and I'm honored to present him to you this evening and this morning. Please welcome Rabbi Edward Feinstein. Good morning. Thank you for this very warm welcome, and thank you for sharing your experiences and your wisdom. I want to thank you as well for allowing me to share this panel with distinguished fellow panelists, with Rav Shofet, who has been a champion of Torah in our community, and with Dr. Beraverian for his staunch support of Israel and for America and for the protection of this community. I want to thank you as well for letting me have a few minutes with Dennis Prager. Um, every morning I have a few minutes with Dennis Prager. Um, and Dennis Prager has done what uh, my wife would only wish she could do. She's made me think again. And that's uh, very powerful. I, I've, I listened to Dennis, and, and I think you have to understand how important Dennis's presence is, not only this morning, but on the radio in an American culture, because he is a quintessential public intellectual. And as a public intellectual, he speaks about values and ethics and politics and the future of the country, and he speaks from a truly, deeply Jewish place. So it is not an exaggeration or a hyperbole to say that in many ways Dennis Prager is the Jewish community's gift back to America for the wonderful gifts that America has given to us. So I thank Dennis for all that he has brought us. <clears throat> and we didn't design this, but I'd like to continue some of the remarks that Dennis made this morning and talk to you not only about civic action, but about yours, about your choices. I'm a rabbi in a very large community. And in my community, there are a variety of different Jews from different kinds of places. And among them, a very large and a wonderfully warm and active community of Persian Jews. So I sit with a child who's about to celebrate his bar mitzvah. And he introduces, to me, he introduces himself to me. He tells me his name is Bobby. But on the form in front of me, it says Babak. So I say, why do you call yourself Bobby? He says, I just like that name. And I look up from the form and I see in front of him his parents. 
And both of his parents either came from Iran when they were very small or they were born here. And both of them have American names, at least on the form in front of me. Robert and, and Kathy or something of that sort. And they're both highly educa educated professionals. They're both graduates of, of UCLA and doing very, very well in the community. His grandparents came from Iran. And his grandparents still have a Shabbat table where the whole family gathers to celebrate the Sabbath. But as I begin to talk to Bobby about his bar mitzvah, his bar mitzvah something interesting comes forth. So I say to him, you're going to give a little talk at the bima. Give four lines in Persian. Speak some Farsi so that your grandparents can hear you speak Farsi so that your grandparents will understand that you carry on the culture from whence you come. I don't want to do that, Rabbi. I don't want to do that. You know, you speak Persian fine. I hear you screaming at your mother. I know you can do this, <laughs> right? So just, just four lines. Say mazel tov to my family and thank you for coming and, and how wonderful it is to be a bar mitzvah. I don't want to do that. And then I understand what's going on. I look into this kid's eyes and I can see what's going on because we speak and we talk about this. He's ashamed. He doesn't want to be Babak anymore. He wants to be Bobby. He doesn't want to have Persian friends at school, even though there are a lot of Persian kids who go to school with him. He wants friends from other backgrounds. He doesn't want to spend the Friday night with his grandparents at their Shabbat table. He wants to be at the high school football game or he wants to be at parties. He doesn't want to be who he was born to be. And now I recognize Bobby. Because this is a quintessential American phenomenon. And I offer this to you not because I'm a great sociologist of America, only because my family came to America one generation before your family came to America. So I live in the neighborhood one generation before you do, and I know where all the dangers are. American sociology says that in the third generation, we let go of our identity. And by the fourth generation, it's gone. And by the fifth generation, it's really gone. Bobby has jumped a generation. He's already playing as if he were fourth generation. He doesn't want to be an Iranian-American Jew. He wants to be an American, and he's not even sure he wants to be a Jew. But Iranian, he's given up already. He doesn't speak it in public. He doesn't want to be with his grandparents. He doesn't want to observe the customs of this family. He wants to change his name and change who he is. And here's the problem, that when the third generation and the fourth generation give up ethnic identity, they also give up the values that they came to America with. The values that Dennis spoke about so beautifully and so powerfully. Values that I've experienced in my community with such joy. Values of family and community and tradition and love for America, and love for freedom, and a deep sense of how the world is put together. The wisdom and the values of this community will be abandoned by the third and the fourth generation unless you do something. Unless you do something. That is to say, those of you who are third generation Americans, your kids aren't going to want anything to do with it unless you do something. And this is the danger of America. Let me tell you something. I am, thank God every day and every night that I was born in this country. My grandfather came from another place, and he came here not because he loved baseball and Chevrolet. He came here because he was running for his life. And when I was a little kid, I remember we would walk down the street, my, my Zayda, my grandfather and I, and if there was anyone in a uniform, he would grab my hand hard and pull me across the street. Because my Zayda had learned in Europe that uniforms are not good for Jews. It didn't matter. A policeman, a fireman, a soldier, a mailman, a plumber, it didn't matter. Zayda would pull me across the street because he was afraid. He lived a life of fear. America has welcomed us and given us the greatest gift any diaspora community has ever given the Jewish people in 2,000 years of diaspora history. I can go to sleep at night without fear. I can wake up in the morning without fear. No one will attack my children. No one will attack my parents. To be welcomed into this country is quite a gift. And if you know Jewish history, you know what a precious, what a precious and rare gift this is. 
But there is, a, there is another side to this American freedom. And here is what I want you to listen to very carefully because I fear that you don't understand this because of your love of America. The other side of American freedom is that it gives every one of us a life of choices and encourages a life of choices. And it says to you again and again, don't be what it was you started out. Choose for yourself, which is also a wonderful gift. But it discourages us from choosing the values of our parents and our grandparents. It makes fun of us for doing that. Most of you will not remember this, but the, one of the great uh, television commercials, one of the first television commercials, 40 years ago, came on television, and it was a television commercial for Clairol hair coloring. And there was a lovely, lovely woman, and she was standing there, and she was radiantly, beautifully blonde. And he said, you would never guess that this blonde hair came from this bottle. And why did I want to be blonde? And she said, because it's true that blondes have fun, and if I have only one life, let me live it as a blonde. If I have only one life, let me live it as a blonde. That was the American quintessential philosophy. I can choose who I want to be. I can choose who I want to be. I don't have to, pr I don't have to practice the profession that my father practiced. I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to follow the values that my parents followed. I don't have to vote the same way that my family did. I don't have to follow the politics that they did. I can create my own lifestyle. I mean, one of the funny things I did when I first came to Los Angeles, came back to LA, I grew up here and I went away for a long time and came back and I'm driving down Santa Monica Boulevard and there's a big billboard for plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon on Santa Monica Boulevard. And I thought this was the craziest thing. I mean, Yo, so they're plastic surgeons, right? They're a plastic surgeon, but now on Santa Monica Boulevard, as big as life, as plastic surgeon, and I gave a blessing for America. Because in America, not only can you choose your values and your politics and your profession and your lifestyle, you can choose the way your body looks. If you don't like the way you look, we can fix it. You can choose your physical appearance. This is a remarkable thing. But here's the problem. The problem is that in America, which offers infinite choices, the basic ideology of that choice philosophy is that if you choose to live the life that your parents and grandparents and their parents lived, there's something wrong with you. And Bobby doesn't want to be Persian. He doesn't want to sit at his family's table. He doesn't want to share the values of the community. He doesn't want to be part of this tradition, and I fear for him. Because what rushes in when a child lets go of his family's philosophy, his family's values, what rushes in to teach him what to want, what teaches him what success means, what teaches him values, what rushes in is a whole bunch of really unhealthy things. For the young Jew who defines his success as a very big car and a very big house, and a partner from another culture who doesn't share family, who doesn't understand that he needs family, who doesn't understand that he needs community, who doesn't understand that he needs peoplehood, who doesn't understand that he needs to give as well as to get. When we define success as all the stuff I've got and not my capacity to give, when we define success as all the toys that I have, my car and my house and my clothes and my looks and all of the things, and not my capacity to share and to build a community, not my capacity to care and to, and to share compassion, that road is a road to despair and a road to tragedy. He will one day live to regret that. I know Bobby's future. I see Bobby's future in a life without values, in a life without connections. It is a deeply lonely life. That's the danger of America's freedom. And that's the danger that Bobby is buying into. And that's the danger that the community of my friends of the Persian community are buying into if they don't take strong, affirmative action to create a new identity for their children and their children's children. And my suggestion is very simple. It will be very, very, very hard to be Iranian-American Jews, to be Persian Jews into the third and fourth and fifth generation. But you can be Jews. Jewish people has done a remarkable thing. We've defied the American sociology. In 1964, 
There was a very famous magazine called Look Magazine. It was one of the great news magazines. And Look Magazine in 1964 put us a, a cover page called The Vanishing American Jew. And it talked about the fact that by the fourth generation, there'll be no Jews left in America. They said by 1980, there'll be no Jews left in America. Let me tell you something wonderful. By 1980, Look Magazine was gone. And we're still here. We're still here. Because Look Magazine defined the Jewish people solely as another American ethnic group, in the same way that there aren't a lot of Polish Americans who are so, so proud and gathered together to celebrate their Polish American heritage. And there are very few Italian Americans anymore who celebrate their Italian heritage. And there are very, very few uh, Irish Americans who celebrate that. They said Jews will be gone by the fourth generation. We're not, because we're more than an ethnicity. We're a community, we're families. We're a faith, we're a culture, we're much deeper than the other trends of American ethnic communities. So here is my suggestion from a humble friend of the Persian community, who without kidding would dearly love to have one of my kids married to this community. 8185. <laughs> my suggestion is that you root yourself in the American Jewish community. You keep your synagogues alive and your community organizations alive, but with a little bit of your spare time, you come and join us. We, the American Jewish community, the Ashkenazim, the gringos, <laughs> we need you. We need your values and your commitments. We need your voice. We need your melodies. We need your recipes. We need your energy. We need your love of tradition. We need your love of values. We need you. And you need us because you need a structure in which to raise your children so that even if they decide to not be so Iranian anymore, they will be Jews, and they'll have values, and they'll understand how to live a life that matters, and how to live a life that's important. Today you will gather to talk about civic activism, but remember that all civic activism is rooted in personal values and personal identity. And you must make strong affirmative steps to be sure that Persian-American kids maintain a sense of who they are and what they are and what is the path for a life that matters and a life that is whole and a life that is healthy. You have brought so much to our community. You have brought so much energy and so much love and so much passion. God bless you, but please, God, don't let it go. Please, please don't let it go. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Yagubzadeh, and I am a co-founder of 30 Years After. Our keynote speaker for this morning was supposed to be Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Mayor Villaraigosa is a great friend of the Jewish community, and he was very much looking forward to addressing our conference. However, due to the tragic Metrolink train accident that took place on Friday, the mayor is not able to join us this morning. Please join me in a moment of silence for the victims of Friday's accident. To convey the mayor's message of support and friendship for our community, we could think of no greater person than our next speaker. In 2007, David Nahai was appointed by Mayor Viragosa to serve as CEO and general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the largest municipal utility in the country. In this capacity, Mr. Nahai is one of only two Iranian Jews serving in local government in Southern California. His appointment is a source of pride for our community and serves as a reminder of Mayor Viragosa's commitment to provide our leaders with opportunities to have a stake in our future. This past June, Mr. Nahai accompanied Mayor Viragosa on a trip to Israel to celebrate its 60th birthday. During their trip, they met with top Israeli leaders and Mayor Viragosa signed security agreements with Israel to enhance anti-terrorism efforts at LAX and the Port of LA. 
They also visited the town of Sterot, where Mayor Viragosa met with the, his mayoral counterpart and demonstrated his solidarity for the town's citizens. Mr. Nahai's distinguished career as a public servant is an inspiration to us all. We are honored to have him here this morning. So please join me in welcoming a true pioneer in our community, Mr. David Nahai. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first say what a pleasure it is for me to share the, this podium with such distinguished speakers and to uh, appear before uh, uh, you uh, this morning um, as a member of your community uh, to address uh, uh, this uh, truly dazzling uh, uh, event today. Um, I heard late last night uh, that, uh, uh, the, that the mayor wanted me to appear on his behalf here this morning. Um, I've not had to time to prepare uh, remarks for you, so I'm going to take uh, just uh, a couple of minutes and uh, speak with you, uh, especially the generation of 30 years after, uh, from my heart. Uh, before I do that, let me uh, emphasize that the mayor, as I'm sure you all know, would certainly have been here if he could have been. Uh, he attends uh, as many Persian Jewish events as he possibly can. He's, I think, attended uh, all of our MacBeat events since he's been in, uh, 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 in office. And, uh, and his feeling of solidarity and uh, affinity uh, uh, for uh, Israel, uh, for Jews, and especially for uh, uh, the Persian Jews, I think, um, is, uh, is unquestioned. Uh, really, uh, if, uh, if anybody had any doubt about it, uh, they should have been uh, with us uh, during the trip to Israel, where, as was just mentioned, uh, the mayor um, really demonstrated um, his, uh, his support uh, and, uh, and his feeling of unity um, with the people of Israel and with Jews uh, everywhere. I mean, I was with him that morning in the town of Sederot. Uh, we, uh, we climbed the hill to look over Gaza the day after uh, 50 Katusha rockets had rained down on the town uh, to see fires still burning, uh, one of them close to a power plant which actually provides electricity to Gaza, and yet that power plant had been the target of an attack. Uh, that evening, uh, that same evening, we were together uh, at the Holy Wall uh, dancing uh, with soldiers. Uh, this is a mayor, I think, um, who, uh, who truly feels uh, in the very fabric of his being, um, uh, the, the, the struggle uh, of Jews everywhere, of the people of Israel, and who truly understands what it is that Persian Jews uh, have endured uh, in our long history and where it is that we stand today. The very name, 30 years after, uh, causes us to pause and reflect. Where are we 30 years after the revolution that brought us here? Um, and I think, as you've just heard, uh, we're doing just fine. It may turn out that in the history of Iranian Jews, uh, the, uh, the, the revolution that occurred might actually turn out to have been a very good thing for us because we're able here to worship in peace, to bring our kids up in freedom, and not to have to worry as we sleep uh, that, our, that our freedom and our safety is going to be threatened. And let me also say this, for those of us in my generation, uh, the, the generation previous to the 30 years after the generation, those of us who used to fret uh, about what it is that our kids were going to become, uh, I believe we needn't worry. We need to work, but we needn't worry. Uh, the 30 years after board has proven that we can continue to be Persian Jews and Americans and that we can reach out and participate and become involved without giving up any part of our own heritage, any part of our values, any part of our identity, and any part of, of a sense of belonging uh, to this uh, incredible history uh, that, uh, that we have uh, stretching back over a very long period of time. But it's also important to note that that participation is happening here. It's happening in America, yes, in California, yes, but particularly in Los Angeles. This is a city in which, at last count, 224 languages are spoken. This is a city which I believe is going to be recognized as the greatest experiment of all times in terms of the history of human civilization. This is a city 
where we can prove that people of all colors, creeds, religions, beliefs, persuasions are able to live together and are able to prosper and thrive together. So for 30 years after, to be holding this conference, which is a conference about participation, it's a conference about reaching out, it's a, part, it's a conference really about political involvement. For that to be happening here in Los Angeles is something that I believe is momentous and something that shouldn't go uh, unnoticed because this is exactly the city where this kind of conference should be had and where this kind of message uh, should, be, uh, should be given. As for me, um, I believe that I am perhaps uh, uh, one of the first waves uh, lapping up at that at the shore of, uh, of greater uh, involvement for the Persian community. My story is well known uh, to you when I'd established my business and, and, and felt that I'd secured my family's future, it became time to do other things. I became involved in the environmental community, served on, a, on the water board and the administration of three governors before I was appointed by the mayor to the DWP commission and later on he asked me to actually step in and, uh, and lead the organization from the inside. Uh, let me tell you, private gain is wonderful, but public service is something else altogether. And this is a trend that we see in immigrant communities. At some point, public service becomes something that, uh, that, that, that communities will, uh, will incline uh, uh, towards. Partly that's an issue of giving back, of contributing back, of recognizing, of thanking uh, uh, one's host country. But partly it's because it signals a sense of ownership and a sense of belonging and a sense that we are a part of this, uh, of this place that we live in. And I think what 30 years after is doing today is that it is signaling that the uh, Persian Jewish community has arrived, that it has unpacked, and that it is ready to assume its rightful place in this wonderful place we call America. Thank you very much. Mr. Hai, hi, thank you very much for addressing us. On behalf of 30 years after and the entire Iranian American Jewish community, we'd like to present you with these two commemorative coins for yourself and Mayor Viragosa. Thank you so much. Thank you. The coins were provided by National Mint of America and the Law Azari family and uh, they are tokens of our appreciation for your contributions to our community oh, so and for Mayor Viragosa's unwavering friendship. Thank you so much. Okay, so so they're not both for the mayor, right? I can <laughs> keep one? You can keep one. Which, which one can I keep? He might not even find out. Maybe you could keep both. No. <laughs> okay. Everyone's going to tell you. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very Thank much. you so much. I'm, I'm touched. Thank you. Thank you, of course. That concludes our morning session. Uh, we'll begin our first panel in 10 minutes. Please be prompt, and um, the next panel will address Iran. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please take your seat. We ask that you please enter the ballroom and take your seat. We will begin momentarily. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We ask that you please take your seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please enter the ballroom and take your seat. We will begin momentarily. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you take your seats. We are going to begin. We ask that you please take your seats. Fleeing the extremist theocracy of Khomeini and his mullahs, the first generation of Iranian-American Jews set out to the United States in search of a future free from religious and ideological persecution. As we stand here 30 years later, it is safe to say that this future has finally been realized. Being one of the most successful and highly educated immigrant communities in the United States, it is imperative from here on out that our community becomes as dedicated to political activism as we are to business and education. Today, we look back at our once fond memories of a country where our roots have been ripped out by a backwards regime and where the future of a community of 20,000 Iranian Jews remains uncertain. Joining us today, is a distinguished panel of international experts. Our first panelist is professor and director of Iranian studies of Tel Aviv University, 
David Menashri, who has traveled here from Israel to join us today. Professor Menashri speaks regularly on matters relating to Iranian politics, politics and history to audiences throughout the world. He has authored several highly acclaimed publications regarding Iran, including The Jews of Iran, Between the Pahlavi Monarchy and the Islamic Republic. Our next panelist is Patrick Lawson, Deputy Director for Research at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, one of the leading think tanks in the country. He's the author or editor of 24 books and monographs, including Eternal Iran. Dr. Clausen has authored more than 70 articles about the Middle East and international economics, appears frequently on television and radio, and has published op-ed articles in major newspapers, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. On a personal note, we can commend Dr. Clausen for spending the last several weeks in Southern California learning Farsi. Our final panelist is Puya Dayanim, a leading political and human rights activist in the Iranian-American Jewish community. Mr. Dayanim is the president of the Iranian Jewish Public Affairs Committee and is a frequently cited foreign policy expert. Moderating today is a true friend and staunch supporter of 30 Years After and the entire Iranian Jewish community, Rabbi Abraham Cooper. Rabbi Cooper is the Associate Director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, one of the most active global Jewish organizations dedicated to the human rights of Jews worldwide. For nearly a quarter of a century, Rabbi Cooper has overseen the Wiesenthal Center's international social action agenda, ranging from worldwide anti-Semitism, Nazi war crimes and restitution, to extremist groups and tolerance education. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel and moderator. Bukhar Tov, everyone, thank you. It is a distinguished panel of experts and a kind act of chesed or folly to include me on them. My first contact with Iranian Jews here in Los Angeles goes back to when we were requested to call then Secretary General of the United Nations Kurt Waldheim to intervene when Rabbi Kohen Sedek was thrown into a Vin prison. A few years later was a memorial service after the first attack on the synagogue in Istanbul which killed the parents of members of the community here, of the Iranian Jewish community. More recently was the incredible struggle to free Shiraz 13. For me, as an observer and a friend of your community, the first real signs of uh, energy, strength, and determination by the Iranian Jewish community in the United States, an especially important time for me because I gained a close friend and uh, a mentor in many ways, Mr. George Harunian, who's with us this morning. So it is a special privilege uh, for me to be here this morning where we can actually sit together and reflect on some of the most difficult issues, uh, but not necessarily deal exclusively with making the emergency phone call worrying about who's going to get out of prison tomorrow to do some creative and perhaps strategic thinking. So for that alone, I think we can all say, Shehechayanu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. One of the greatest arguments we were making all along to Iranian Jews here in Southern California was that their voice always mattered. And now on September 25th, a number of religious groups, including the World Council of Churches, the Mennonite Church, and other distinguished theologians, have decided to break bread with President Ahmadinejad when he comes to New York yet again. Unless their plan is to serve Hamantashin, Oznei Haman, 
we call upon 30 years after and all of the distinguished Iranian Jewish organizations present here this morning to join with the Simon Wiesenthal Center in urging each of these distinguished theological groups, especially the Christian groups, to think again and cancel an event that will only further honor and embolden and empower one of the most dangerous tyrants on the planet today. In a moment, I'm going to call on three experts, if you look in your program, who are going to, in 10 minutes each, give you a brief overview on some of the most pressing questions we have vis-a-vis -vis Iran. They'll each speak for 10 minutes, and then I'll return here to uh, take questions from the audience so we can maximize our interaction with these great people. Before doing so, I want to give you a brief quote from a great leader in the world today, not just a Jewish leader, not just an Israeli leader, but a great humanitarian. His name is Natan Sharansky, and this quote while it talks about his own philosophy towards life, in many ways reflects the struggle of the last 30 years of your community. In his book, Defending Identity, he says, quote, for some in the democratic world committed to freedom and human rights, identity means prejudice, intolerance, distrust, and violence against those who are different. Religion and nationalism are negative, even belligerent. But for many committed to identity, pure freedom seems egotistic, materialistic, decadent, and weak. The free world's so-called values lack identity's depth of lasting experience and meaning. This contrast is especially felt by those who suddenly enter one of these two worlds. Likewise, for people who have been deprived of a meaningful connection to others, the discovery of a new identity opens a new and larger world that they belong to, one that fulfills and empowers them. Those who find themselves new born into identity discover the incredible depth of history, the power of belonging, of connecting to past generations and shaping future ones, of living a life that is beyond the self. To them, democracy and human rights are meaningful only to the extent that they allow this sense of connection without which freedom itself can seem empty. That is why those who discover themselves on one side see the other as unimportant, negligible, if not altogether detrimental. Without the exponents of democracy and identity each suspicious or downright hostile to the other, recognizing and reconciling the virtues of both becomes exceedingly difficult challenge." Unquote. The Iranian Jewish community has been on both sides of this divide. Your role in the future, not just for Persian Jews, not just for your adopted homeland, but in the struggle of finding a connectiveness to the old homeland, I think has extraordinarily important potential. I myself just returned from three days this last week in Kurdistan. I spent most of my time just a few miles from the Iranian border where Saddam Hussein gassed Kurds 20 years ago. A few weeks ago, I was in Baku and had a chance to reconnect with the Azeri leadership of that community. That part of the world reminds, quote unquote, American experts that in those areas, identity for now trumps all. Our role here this morning is to hear from great experts who, Baruch Hashem, thankfully, have their feet firmly planted in two worlds and perhaps can help guide us to find a way to deconstruct those who have hijacked identity on the road to oblivion. Ladies and gentlemen, may I uh, have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Professor David Menashri.
בוקר טוב, שבוע טוב, good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. A friend of mine who heard that I'm coming to Los Angeles, knowing that I was here, I uh, was in the States two weeks ago, and I have to be back in the U.S. twice in the next two months, asked me why you are traveling that far. So I told him, you know, I spent all my life studying Iran. These days, Los Angeles is the closest that I can get to Tehran. But more seriously, after receiving the invitation from 30 years after, I checked uh, with a few friends, what is this organization that I've never heard about? And well, I was so touched by what I heard from this organization that I immediately responded positively to this invitation and decided to come all the way from Tel Aviv to be with you today. <laughs> Because I think that what you are doing here the 30 years after, it's an historical change in the life of Iranian Jewish community in Israel, in the States, in Iran, and all over the world. The future is yours, and we really are so thankful, and I think I speak about people old like I am, that uh, asking, uh, urging you to continue this effort, keep your unity and good spirit, and continuing to serve the good causes that you are serving. And while doing so, and focusing on Iran and the United States, please don't forget Israel. I think that the bonds between the Iranian, Iranian Jews, American Jews, Jews worldwide, and Israel are so firm and are supposed to be even firmer because I think that we in Israel and the Jews in diaspora, we are two wings of, of the same bird. And God forbid, if one of us is weak, the other will suffer. We depend on you, but if, you, if, you, if I may, Jews in diaspora also depend on the strength and well-being of the state of Israel. So we have the same, <laughs> the same destiny. It's up to you, the young generation, to keep this uh, value high on your agenda. More seriously, uh, I said earlier that I came here because it, it, Los Angeles is so close to Tehran. Uh, the main reason was the appreciation for this group. And not only that I agreed to come, but I offered them immediately, after again studying more about the conference and about this group, to hold the continuation of this conference in the Center of Iranian Studies in Tel Aviv uh, in, in few months from now. Uh, they agreed, and I hope that in few months, uh, I believe it will be in May, June, we will have a more academic conference on 30 years after in uh, Tel Aviv. And finally, on this regard, I would say that I, I think that we should also establish in Israel a similar uh, group of 30 years after with young Iranian Israelis. But you know, the Israeli Iranians are more Israeli than Iranians, and uh, they, they, they are not that much interested in uh, what's going on in Iran. But I think that it is important because the Iranian Jews in Israel uh, lake organization and I think that we need the, the new blood of the young people to come and help educating the elderly how to run <coughs> the affairs of, this, of the community. I spent two years in Tehran in the mid-70s, more than 30 years before, uh, ago. When I came back from Tehran, many people asked me, <coughs> well, what did you learn in Iran? I went there to do field study on my PhD in Tel Aviv University on education in Iran. My response was that I learned in Iran two things that I carry with me even 30 years after. I learned to appreciate in Iran the, the importance of having a Jewish state of Israel. And I learned in Iran also to appreciate the meaning of democracy. And how come? Because I think that I, I was raised all my life in, in Israel. I was born in Tehran and I immigrated to, I didn't immigrate. They, my parents took me when I was four years old to Israel. There was no Los Angeles at that time, I believe. And uh, uh, since then, uh, I consider myself, and I am uh, an, uh, an Israeli, and I lived in the Jewish state. And I saw in Iran a Jewish community enjoying all rights, I would say, no less than the Muslims in Iran under the rule of the Shah, but still s knowing and sensing that they are a minority and fearing from the, non from the Muslims. And I thought that's so good for me to raise my children in Israel where no one will give them hard time because they are Jews. 
a year after there was a revolution and the situation of the Jews became even much worse than it used to be under, under the Shah. The other thing is that I learned is the value of democracy. Because for me, the most important thing after being a Jew and Israeli is to live in a democratic society. And of course, you don't learn the meaning of democracy in a non-democratic state of Iran. But for the first time that I live in a non-democratic state, I realize what is the value of democracy. And I think that you should keep in mind, the young generation, the 30 years after generation, the significance of democracy. It should not be taken for granted. And democracy brought the Jews of Iran such a great success. See what happened to the Jews of Iran one generation after they were released from the hands of a non-democratic country. Living in democratic systems, in Europe, in the United States, in Israel, the Iranian Jews are successful and made a change in their life more than any other community that I know. Within one generation, look at the success of Iranian Jews. And this is not only because of the Iranian gene and, and all the qualities that we have, also because of our living in a democratic society. 30 years after moving to Iran, the Iranian revolution, in my view, failed to achieve its, its aims. The revolution was not about to return to Islam. I, don't, I would not agree that this was the aim of the people of Iran who moved to the, to the revolution. The, gen the revolution was about making life better for the children of Iran. 30 years after, if you look at the life of the Iranian people, the two main goals of the Iranians over 100 years used to be welfare and democracy, welfare and freedom. In terms of freedom and welfare, the situation today is not much better, if at all, from the days, the days of the Shah. Rather than dealing with the problems of the Iranian society, the Iranian regime, the Islamic regime of Iran, is dealing with other issues not related to them, like the life of the Israelis, helping the Hezbollah, the Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, and interfering with the life of others. I think it's time that the Iranian regime, if they want to continue, I don't care about what kind of regime Iran has. They can have, this is up to them to decide what the regime they have. I only care that they will not interfere with my life and what, like, won't make the life of the people of Israel more miserable uh, in, by, their, by their action, by their support for other radical movements around the border of Iran. The Iranian regime succeeded in maintaining in power, but failed, I would say, or at least has not been successful in giving the people of Iran be hope for better, for better life. Therefore, if, since the revolution, in my view, was not successful in achieving its goals, the, the revolution is not yet over and it's searching for ways to implement its vision. As far as Israel is concerned, Iran, Iran presents a threat, a very serious challenge. I would say it is not, in my view, it's not an existential a threat because I think Israel is indestructible and no matter what the Iranians want to do they will not be able to distract the Jewish state of Israel <laughs> but they are making their, our life but they are lacking, making our life miserable in many different ways first the combination of radical ideology as being kept by the Iranian regime with nuclear weapon on the other hand it's something that Israel and the world cannot tolerate Second, Iran has become a neighbor of Israel today. Iran and Israel did not have any wars in the past. No Israeli soldiers were killed by Iranians, no Iranians were killed by Israelis, but today the Iranians are coming close and close to the borders of Israel, actually encircling Israel with their support for radical movement, and it's another challenge for Israel. The growth of Islamic radicalism and Shiite radicalism is another challenge for Israel. Their opposition to the peace process. Unfortunately, right now, we, the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Syrians, are destroying every hope, any hope for peace. But if one day we will have a progress in peace process, rest assured that the Iranians will do whatever they know they can to disrupt the peace process. What can be done in one world? There are ways to deal with the Iranian challenge. Let me just tell you one word. The problem of Iran is not the problem of Israel alone. I think it's at the time that the world will learn that the problem of Iran is the problem of the, free, of the Western civilization, of democracy system of the world. What can be done is pressure on Iran. Pressure helps. 
Unfortunately, whenever there is pressure and it's beginning to succeed, what we see in Iran that they give, they gain, uh, they gain uh, heart and, and hope from the Americans and from the Europeans, release, uh, removing the pressure, including the uh, national uh, the, uh, intelligence estimate a year ago. Europe should, gain, should use its, its, its moral muscles to pressure more on Iran on, the, on human rights. The Middle Eastern countries, the Arab moderate countries, should give a hand to the Israelis to cooperate together because if you want really to weaken Iran, if we solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, Iran which will much more weaken. And finally, the main hope of Iran is in the young people of Iran. The young people of Iran who brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power 30 years before, it's, up, it's time that they will engage in, uh, in ways to change the policy of this, of this regime. The Iranians are capable of doing so. Iran had two big revolutions in the 20th century, four huge movements in the, in the last hundred years, and I think this, they are up to change the situation in Iran. The main question is when we have two trains, two trains driving, one carrying the message of change of regime, the other is carrying the message of nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, the, the, the train with nuclear weapon is driving much faster than the social change in Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Manashri. Uh, just to note, the uh, committee has provided notepads on each of your tables. Uh, I imagine that uh, the topics being uh, talked about briefly generate a lot of questions and comments. Please feel free to jot them down. The young people have plenty of energy. They're going to circulate throughout. And uh, we'll send them up to us, time permitting. We'll try to uh, reflect in the Q&A the kinds of questions that you have uh, in the audience. Uh, next, to test out his newfound prowess in the Persian, we call upon our friend Patrick Lawson from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Patrick. Uh, thank you much. Well, I am, fortunately for you, by training an economist, so I'm going to say a few words about the economy. And I'm from Washington, so I have to say a few words about U.S.-Iranian relations. So let me start out with the economy. What a contrast in the last 30 years between the dramatic economic success of the Iranian Jewish American community and the miserable economic record of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Iranian Jewish American community started out with many disadvantages not necessarily knowing the language well, having to flee their country and come to a strange place, oftentimes having to leave most of their resources behind them, whereas the Islamic Republic had much going for it. Uh, the price of oil was very high after the revolution. And indeed, if we look today, I Iran is earning more money from its oil exports than it ever has, much more than it did under the Shah, $80 billion this year. And yet, Iran's economy is not in good shape. It's not a disaster, but it's not in good shape. What a contrast there is between Tehran and Dubai. Anybody who goes to Dubai can see a city that's popping, a city that's moving, that's always in the news, with exciting new buildings and the spirit in that city of real growth and movement. And that's because Dubai is open to the outside world and Dubai is tolerant. What a contrast with Tehran, where, to be honest, the uh, situation has gotten to be pretty bad in this last year. Uh, this summer, there are serious electricity outages, which the government claims are a mere two hours a day. Now, how would you like it if you lived on the 20th story of an apartment building and you were told the electricity was going to be out only two hours a day, so you only had to walk up and you could ride back down in the elevator? Uh, and last winter, natural gas was cut off. People didn't have heating in many cities of Iran, and it was almost cut off in Tehran. Oh, and did I mention that inflation, according to the government, is only 27.6% last month? Uh, 
The simple fact is that Iran's revolutionary leaders don't care very much about the economy. They care much more about the Mahdi than about money. And uh, also, the revolutionary leaders, as far as they're concerned, uh, the economy is doing pretty well. That is, they're doing pretty well. Indeed, those who are running Iran are doing quite nicely themselves and don't care that much about the country as a whole. It says a lot about modern-day Iran that an apartment sold in Tehran a few months ago for $15 million in a country with 15% unemployment and where teachers make $300 a month. $15 million would be a pretty good price for an apartment here in LA. Just think what it's like in a city of $300 a month for the teachers. And that's when they get paid they went on strike this year because their pay was months behind. So I'm painting a picture of a situation where we are going to, in the West, are going to have grave difficulties influencing the decision makers in Iran by economic instruments because they don't care that much about how their country's economy is doing. So whether it's economic incentives, offers of better trade and investment, such as the Europeans like, or whether it's economic sticks, like increased sanctions, such as the United States often prefers, we're going to have difficulties moving these guys through economic levers. We must try. We must appeal to the more rational leaders in the country, and there are many, uh, but let's be honest, our chances are mixed. Well, that's the economy. How about relations with the United States? There, I guess my fundamental message to you would be that what really matters to the hardline leaders who run Iran is not the relations with Washington, it's the relations with Hollywood. Khomeini, the supreme leader, makes clear in his speeches that he is much more worried about cultural invasion than he is about military invasion that he thinks that Hollywood's movies are much more dangerous for Iran's revolution than are any of the pronouncements and actions out of Washington. This is a man who thinks that the fundamental problem facing Iran is cultural invasion, the values of the West. And he is eloquent on this subject and has been for 15 years. Indeed, in the last 10 years, he has added to this an interesting twist. He talks a lot about a velvet revolution. And that's a phrase which has become better known in Iran than in Eastern Europe where the phrase originated. When Czechoslovakia in 1989 had popular protests, their communist government fell in what was called a velvet revolution. And it happened extremely quickly. Indeed, on Thursday morning, one week, the communist government looked like it was firmly in power. By the next Tuesday, Mr. Havel was the president of Czechoslovakia and the Communist Party was out in four days. And Khamenei is convinced that the Khatami story tells him that the same thing could happen in Iran. That is, that the women, the youth, and the intellectuals of Iran would dearly love to abandon the revolution and get rid of it entirely. And then it could all be gone very quickly. And Khamenei thinks that what caused this velvet revolution in Eastern Europe was a conspiracy theory by the West. He calls it postmodern imperialism. I'm not making this up. Right? And the man says that it's the support for non-governmental organizations, the radio and television broadcasting supported by Western governments, which bring about these color revolutions like the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia or uh, the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine. Um, and uh, that is why Khomeini ordered a 67-year-old American grandmother Hala Esfandiari held for months in jail, claiming that she was a mortal threat to the Islamic Republic. And when his television wanted to show the risks represented by this horrible person and three other Iranian Americans who were also being held, 
Iranian television put on a show which explained how George Bush and George Soros meet every week to plan together how to overthrow the Iranian government. Now, if any of you know uh, Mr. Soros and his activities, you will know that he has spent many millions of dollars uh, trying to uh, defeat Mr. Bush and uh, the idea that the two of them conspire together, well, it's intriguing. I'm often asked about what are the prospects for change in Iran. And what I like to say is that I think I know something about Iran, but I'm quite certain that Supreme Leader Khamenei knows his country better than I do. And this man lives in mortal fear of a velvet revolution. He is worried that one 67-year-old Iranian-American grandmother can bring his government crashing down quickly. I hope he's right. I hope he's right. But I would just note that while I think it's a very good idea to try to engage Iran and to engage the government of Iran, let's be honest, that's Khamenei's greatest fear. That's his greatest worry. So any idea that our offer to engage Iran is going to be such a huge inducement that it's going to lead to some huge change in Iran's foreign policy. <laughs> well, I hope so, but I have my doubts. So I have to tell you that I am not sure that we will be able to influence this government either by offer this government in Iran, either by offers of engagement or by economic measures. Our possibilities for influence in the government of Iran are limited. I think we should try, but I, I, I don't think we should expect there to be any magic bullet and I, we should understand the great challenges that we are going to face. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, who's uh, one of the great Jewish leaders of our time, <clears throat> once said to me that as he gets older, he becomes more and more convinced that in America, 90% of leadership is just showing up. Democracy in our country is about that, becoming involved, getting a few people together, and showing others that you can change the status quo. What a wonderful opportunity this morning as the 30 years after launched their uh, first major event for the broader community to be able to call upon Puya Dayanim, someone who leads by example from the Iranian Jewish Public Affairs Committee to add his perspective. And again, I emphasize that would be a good time right now for you to write up your questions and send them forward to the front. Puya? Let me uh, say good morning to you all. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you've all joined us um, on a Sunday. Uh, uh, I deeply appreciate uh, the hard work that 30 years after has put into this conference and because my time is limited I am going to delve into the topics that uh, have been asked of us. Um, if you permit me I'm going to address the issue of Iran first and then uh, talk about the issue of Iranian Jews. Patrick has asked me to definitely speak about Iranian Jewish advocacy. If someone brings up a question I'll definitely address that issue. Uh, when we look at the world now today, we now see uh, that the new world order that the first George Bush was talking about is pretty much like the old world order. Russia is now going back to the old USSR. As Americans, we must decide in the next two months that as Russia reasserts itself with its new power and its new wealth, whether we wish to elect a Reagan or a Carter. However, there is a dangerous twist to the reappearance of Russia as a major player in the world order. The green belt of Islam that Carter and Brzezinski designed to contain communism may now be aligning itself with Russia and China to stop the US influence in the world 
and to actually threaten the US, Western Europe, Japan, Canada, Israel, and other leading world democracies. They are using oil and terror to bring about this change. Therefore, it is of absolute importance for us here in the US to gain energy independence and stop giving our money to countries that hate us. That's just a general observation that I have uh, of the world. Let me address the issue of Iran. The Islamic regime in Iran is the cancer that is eating away the Middle East. It is a source of instability in Iraq, in the Gulf countries, in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestinian territories, and Israel. We have had two good options to deal with Iran and contain Iran. One good option, which I think we should have taken up on and the U.S. should have really invested in starting in 1997, was the regime change option, supporting the democratic forces in Iran. However, in 1999, when students in Tehran University started to riot in support of journalists, President Clinton said that that was an internal issue and did not lend his support to the pro-democracy forces in Iran. The Bush administration, after 2001, after 9-11, although it declared Iran to be part of the axis of evil and stated that it was on the side of the people of Iran, never managed to formulate a proper Iran policy and wasted six years away. Starting in 2002, European countries attempted to negotiate with Iran to contain the Iranian nuclear threat. Now, in fall of 2008, more than half a decade later, Iran continues its threatening nuclear program without any containment. We had many, many, many years to support pro-democracy forces. We had many years to engage in a serious multilateral sanctions regime with the help of Europe, Russia, China, and other countries, but never managed to do so. And as we look at the UN Security Council today, it's very obvious that a serious multilateral sanctions regime will not be implemented. Russia will veto such an attempt. Now we're left with two very bad options. Appeasing the Iranian regime and negotiating with them from the position of weakness, where every other administration has tried to do the same and has failed or engage in a preemptive nuclear strike or a military strike against Iran's nuclear facilities with unknown consequences. So as you analyze each of the options, you see that sanctions have failed because they were never implemented in the first place. Sufficient resources were not invested in supporting the pro-democracy forces. No one is seriously threatening Iran with a nuclear or a preemptive strike against its nuclear facilities. Therefore, whether we want to or not, the only long-term option to deal with the cancer of the Islamic Republic, both from a moral point of view and from a strategic point of view, is to support the pro-democracy forces and bring about regime change. Even if the multilateral sanctions regime works, even if negotiating with, with them stops the nuclear program, they're going to continue to terrorize their women, the minorities, their own people, and they're going to continue to support Hamas, Hezbollah, and other terrorist organizations. Therefore, although there are different options to deal with the nuclear program, the only long-term option for the people of Iran to deal with Iran as a state sponsor of terror and to deal with Iran as a nuclear force is to overthrow the regime. Let me address the issue of Iranian Jews. 
In 1994, the Iranian regime took a 78-year-old man by the name of Faisal Mehrubad, charged him, he was a cantor in Yusuf Abad synagogue, charged him with espionage for Israel, gouged eyes, his eyes, tortured him, executed him, and threw him in a Muslim cemetery. The family had to spend sufficient resources to exhume his body and give him the proper Jewish burial. I wrote an article in a publication here in LA called Cheshmandaz, and I said that the alarm bells are ringing for the Jews in Iran, and it is time for our community here in LA to do something. However, my words were not heeded by the community and the old established leadership at the time. Between 1994 and 1999, each year, the regime continued to execute one Iranian Jew and 12 Iranian Jews who attempted to leave through the borders of Pakistan went missing. And then we arrived to March 1999 when the regime decided to take down the religious leadership of Shiraz and Esfahan in a case that became famous as the case of the Shiraz 13. And that is when I and my colleagues decided that silence was no longer an option and that we had a moral obligation to speak out. I want you to compare and contrast the approach that we took and the approach that had failed the approach of quiet diplomacy and the advocacy that you're all here to learn about and engage in. Those 13 Jews were not killed and were all eventually freed. Since 1999 until today, the regime has not dared to arrest or kill one more Jew. However, <laughs> however, Iran continues to pursue a policy of cultural genocide. They just destroyed five synagogues and burial sites in Mahale in Tehran. We do not have a single rabbi who has been trained as a rabbi in Iran. We cannot publish Hebrew liturgy in Iran. We have Jewish schools in Iran, but they're open on Shabbat. And when you look at the leadership that Iranian Jews have in Tehran, if you talk to the Central Jewish Committee of Tehran and its head is going to be here in two weeks, it is in fact the Ministry of Information and Security that decides who the Jewish MP is in the Iranian Majlis and who gets to be the head of the Central Jewish Committee. They're engaging in the cultural genocide, genocide of our people, creating inducement for Jews in Iran to be non-Jews. If someone dies and passes away, I have one more minute and I'll be done. If someone dies and passes away, if the daughter or the son converts to Islam, they get to have the entire parent's inheritance. So if you want to keep your inheritance and your brother or your sister became a Muslim to get it all, the only way for you to also get your share is to convert to Islam. In the long term, this policy will eradicate our population. When you read the virulent anti-Semitic press in Iran, always know that where there is smoke, there is fire. The Jews in Iran are in danger, and they must and should leave, and, and they should do so as soon as possible. I will support them, defend them, and will try to keep the doors of the Iranian refugee program open. The defense of the Jews in Iran is a moral obligation for all of us, one which I have made my life's mission. And I encourage you all to help organizations such as 30 Years After to make sure that never again never happens in Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Poyo. Well, we have uh, a number of uh, very interesting questions that really 
go right across the spectrum. And um, maybe the toughest one that is in the back of everyone's mind and would come, I guess, right back to you, Puya. I know my own feelings on this question. But as the moderator, I want to put it right in front of uh, the panel, starting with you and uh, with everyone else here. And I won't change one word from the question. Considering that there are still a few thousand Jews in Iran, sort of like hostages, if any fight breaks out with Israel, what are the wise ways, way of handling Iran without hurting them? Is it wise for the Persian Jewish community outside of Iran to strongly speak out against the regime? Puya, we'll start with you, but I'd like to hear from our other two experts as well. My mic doesn't work. Or does it? It works? Okay. Um, I think it's a very delicate question. And this is a topic that I've been having um, ongoing discussions now for the past two months since a new leadership has been elected in the Iranian Jewish Federation here in LA. I believe that Iranian Jews as a community should not be at the forefront of the war against uh, the Islamic Republic. That Iranian Jews should not be at the forefront of overthrowing the Iranian regime. However, as Iranians, as people who lived in that country, uh, we should be supportive of the pro-democracy forces in Iran in general. Um, however, uh, I want to qualify my remarks and make it quite clear. Although we should not be at the forefront of uh, defending pro-democracy forces in Iran or promoting an Israeli strike against Iran, which, by the way, I do not support a, a strike anyways. I think that's a short-term band-aid, as I discussed. We definitely and we must be at the forefront of defending the Jews in Iran. Uh, that's a very clear distinction that I want to make. Only Iranian Jews can really defend Iranian Jews. Um, that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Professor? Uh, I think that the, uh, the problem of Iran is the problem of the free world, uh, not of the Jewish people and not for Israel. A long time ago, I, I, I think in the last 15 years, I'm knocking on each and every door in Israel, with speaking with prime ministers and ministers, to beg our politicians to do one small thing. Shut up on the issue of Iran. The less we, we speak, the better it is for us. Uh, by, by volunteering to speak up against Iran, we are pretending as though, first, we have the solution to this issue, and the solution is not easy at all. Second, it is that it's solely the problem of Israel, and it is not. So I think that uh, there is a lot to be done, but here we have a dilemma. If Israel and the Jews do not speak up, the issue will be forgotten. And this is the question, is, I'll leave it to each and every of you, how we should deal with it. If we speak up, it's not good. If we don't speak up, it's not good. So we have to find a way of doing a diplomacy that will be secret. And I think that, to be honest with you, the Iranians are doing much better in their open diplomacy. There are two games which are very popular in Iran and, in fact, associated with Iran. One is Begamon and the other is Chase. Unfortunately, I think that the world is playing backgammon with the Iranians when the Iranians are calculating their steps, five steps ahead, and playing chess with the world. It's time that we be more smart and being more quiet, but being aware every day that the clock is ticking and there is a real danger for many, many nations in the region. Patrick. The Baha'i community and the evangelical Christian community in Iran face very serious persecution. The evangelical Christians, not least because they're actively evangelizing and converting quite a few Muslims. Their experience has been that when they keep quiet about persecution, the situation gets worse. When they protest and protest loudly, sometimes nothing happens Sometimes things get better, but never once have things gotten worse. That's a powerful lesson. My second comment would be that the problem of Iran's nuclear program is primarily a problem 
because of the risk that it will undermine our system for containing the spread of nuclear weapons. There's a reason the French government has been tough as nails and extremely active in this issue. France has not been out there to help defend Israel's security. France has been defending France's security. Because France, like all the great powers, think that this world would be a dangerous place if there were 20 or more countries that had nuclear weapons. The main reason the great powers are involved in the issue of the Iranian nuclear program is to stop proliferation. It is not a good idea for American friends of Israel to talk about Iran's nuclear program primarily in the context of the risk that Iran represents to Israel. A grave risk, a grave risk, but that's not going to move Americans. The issue has to be portrayed as a grave risk to American national security, and it is. Not only because of the revolutionary regime in Iran, but because of the risk that many other countries would follow Iran's example, that there would be a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, and that many countries around the world would want to follow the Iranian example. To give you one example, the most frequent visitor to Tehran since Ahmadinejad came to power has been Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, who says that he wants to follow the example of Iran's nuclear program, and Iran has volunteered to help him. I don't think that American security would be better off if Venezuela is a nuclear-armed country. It's much easier for us to persuade people of the risk from Iran's nuclear program if we present it as a risk to America's national security if many countries have nuclear weapons. We shouldn't present the risk to Israel as the canary in the coal mine. The fundamental problem with the Iranian nuclear program is not the threat to Israel, but the threat to world peace. Thank you, Patrick. I would just like to uh, emphasize one point that Patrick just raised, since it's uh, something that's not talked uh, often enough. Obviously, most of the people here today are of Iranian uh, Jewish descent, and uh, most Angelenials will say that's very nice, exercising a democracy. Good to see that you're uh, showing a democratic and communal muscle. What does it have to do with me? The answer, nuclear issues aside, Hugo Chavez. President Ahmadinejad, I believe, has visited uh, Venezuela five times. Hezbollah agents go in and out on four flights a week from Tehran, some of which stop in uh, Damascus, coming to Caracas. You think about the oil weapon that's being uh, wielded. The impact on the Americas already of having um, someone at the tipping point by the name of Ahmadinejad uh, is already impacting on our national security as we speak in ways that have little to do with the Jewish community and nothing to do with Israel. So it'll be important as 30 years after uh, further develops its, uh, its reach and understanding is to uh, also make sure it's up to speed on what's happening to the Baha'i and other minority communities, even if it doesn't necessarily mean public action, but awareness is, uh, is half the challenge here. And also beginning to uh, explain to the broader community here in California uh, the true scope of the threat that Patrick was just alluding to. Um, let me go to the next question, which everyone has touched on, but is worth one more focus, and I'll start with, uh, with the doc, with the professor, Dr. Menashri. Um, what do you think about if necessary, a uh, military strike uh, against such the nuclear facilities in Iran, on the one hand, by the U.S. and or Israel. Uh, and on the other hand, as one person in the audience uh, asked, uh, would it be uh, appropriate to force Israel to put on the table its nuclear capabilities, to sideline those capabilities in return uh, for international guarantees that uh, Iran and others would never attack it? Well, that's not easy. Uh, I, I begin with the diff more difficult issue of uh, Israeli nuclear power. Uh, they say that Israel has some uh, nuclear uh, bombs, 
But I was raised in Israel, and I remember many years that it, this was said. And even in the most difficult times, and I remember two times in my life, and I was a soldier in the front, we feared that this is the end of the state of Israel in May 67 and in October 73. Israel did not threaten, did not use nuclear weapon. When you have nuclear facilities in the hand of responsible regime, it is something else. When you have nuclear weapon in the hands of people who are so radical, and that's why I say the combination of radical ideology and nuclear power, that's the, the issue. And you have someone who's speaking in the name of uh, apocalyptic mission and believing that designed by God to pave the way to the return of the imam, then a nuclear the, uh, uh, power is, is, is a problem. About a, a military solution, I share what uh, Puya, my friend Dayanim said, I hope we will not get there. It will be disastrous for all sides involved. I am not a military man, I don't know what are the capabilities. I know one thing, when Israel attacked the nuclear facilities in Iraq in June 81, there were no threats against Iran. When there was something happening in September 2006 in Syria, or 2007, there was no threat. There was a beautiful movie that most of you, you know, the young people may not remember, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. There was a nice line there. I believe you know what is this line, and I don't even want to repeat it. You don't have to state all kinds of things if you really mean to do something. I hope there will not be need for military action for the well-being of the Israelis or the Americans, Europeans, and the well-being of the Iranians. There are other ways to get out of this mess. Thank you. I'm going to ask Patrick, who's based in Washington, to uh, make a comment on this question, but also, if he would, uh, with the uh, proviso that he economic sanctions have limitations, where do they bite, and what would you suggest such moves uh, should still be taken? Uh, first, I, I shamelessly will plug my own publication uh, called The Last Resort, Consequences of Preventive Military Action Against Iran. You can find it on our website. The main point that we make is that the consequences of preventive military action against Iran might, may be terrible but it would also be terrible if Iran had nuclear weapons. And uh, therefore, each of the options that would be faced in that kind of a situation would be horrible. Let me remind the audience when it comes to the question of Israel's nuclear program that it's been 20 years that it's been the stated position of the Israeli government that they look forward to the day when the Middle East can be a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction, including of nuclear weapons, because the Middle East is a zone of such peace and mutual trust and understanding that that would be possible. On the questions of economic sanctions, as you heard me say, the leaders of the Islamic Republic don't care that much about the country's economy. But what we've been able to do with the economic sanctions is to impose very strict limits on dual-use items that are used also for military purposes as well as civilian purposes. And because of these three sanctions resolutions by the United Nations and some pretty tough enforcement actions by Europe about these dual-use items, Iran has faced some real problems with its nuclear program which is not as proceeded as quickly as it could have. Unfortunately, that program proceeds in fits and starts. Recently, it's had a start. I hope it has more fits. Uh, but uh, we have been able to slow it down through the use of pretty tough restrictions on these kinds of dual-use items. Uh, thank you. We have about um, four minutes uh, left. What I'd like to do is forego the last questions and have uh, each of our speakers um, sum up. Let me just ask uh, everyone, since everyone here is appropriately plugging, when you get a chance, go to Wiesenthal.com and send the message to both political candidates for the President of the United States that we want a bipartisan energy policy starting in January that will uh, take us out of the noose of uh, oil and put us on a different track. So it's bipartisan, it makes no difference who you vote for.
But it really is, we say in the old country, Aleph Bet. If we don't do it, we're just setting the, at stage for our own demise. We'll, do, we'll now um, just um, end by reversing the order and asking Puya to say a closing word. Uh, so I'm going to keep my promise to Patrick and address the last topic. What role can Iranian-American Jews play in affecting American policies towards Iran? Um, I've been going to Washington for many, many years. Usually when I go to Washington, one of the first people I visit is Patrick to get a good idea what's going on and get updated before I start my meetings with government officials, members of Congress, and other think tankers. Um, in Washington, in the past six to seven years, we are now seeing organizations uh, pop up that have very grandiose names. The American Iranian Council. What that entity is, it's, a, its head is Hushang Amir Ahmadi. It's a basically a pro-regime lobby organization which is largely funded by oil companies. Then we have an organization called the Iranian American Political Action Committee. Sort of the same thing. The Iranian Trade Association, the Iranian American Bar Association, and of course, most dangerously, is an organization called the National Iranian American Council on its head, Trita Parsi. This is an organization that reaches out to Ira uh, Iranian Americans and says, hey, why does the U.S. want to go and attack our country? Why is it that your grandmother has to be fingerprinted when they come to visit you? Why is it that we cannot uh, send food and medicine to your family in Iran? And they play on the heartstring of the Iranian Americans, particularly the younger generation. Uh, they use the membership dues, but what they really do in Washington is to promote uh, negotiations and relations with the Islamic regime. Uh, it is our duty as Iranians and as Jews to go to Washington and educate uh, American politicians, particularly some of the folks who are going to be speaking here, uh, Congressman Waxman, Congressman Berman, Congressman Schiff, that you can support Iran, you can be pro-peace, uh, you can respect the history and the culture of Iranians without being supportive of the Iranian regime. There are two different things. There are resolutions in Congress right now uh, calling for an embargo uh, on uh, uh, sending ga processed gasoline back to Iran. Many Jewish members of Congress in the Democratic Party aren't supporting them. Uh, they think it's a waste of time. And in fact, they are going to die uh, in this Congress, but they may get resurrected next year. So what can you do? You should speak out. You should go to Washington. And you should share your views with those that really make a difference. Instead of talking amongst yourself, you should talk to the people who are decision makers. Thank you. Sorry that I took up your time. Let me rush in where angels fear to tread and uh, offer uh, similar advice, which is I, I would urge you uh, to help us counter the pernicious influence of uh, some organizations which portray there being two policies, anti-Iran policies and pro-Iran policies. And they describe the anti-Iran policies as being anything which is anti-regime, as somehow being opposed to Iranian culture, Iranian tradition, pride in Iranian civilization, and pride in being an Iranian American. It's very important that you find ways to reach out to other Iranian American groups and say, let's work together to promote pride in the accomplishments of the Iranian American community and pride in being Iranian American, and to disassociate that in any way from the position that people take vis-a-vis -vis the, re the regime. That it's important that there's been understanding that pride in Iranian American uh, tradition, uh, pride in Iranian heritage, is separate from support for the Islamic Republic. Uh, I'm aware the time is, uh, uh, is done up. Uh, let me just, one, one word on one issue, and it's uh, the Jews of Iran in Iran. Uh, Jews have a long uh, his heritage and history of living in Iran for over 2,000 years. I think at this stage there is no future to the Judaism in Iran anymore. 
And I know that uh, we are speaking in, in LA, but maybe this message can go back to Iran. The regime has been more or less fair to the Jews of Iran with all the difficulties. It could be much worse. But I think that the parents, the Jewish parents in Iran, are not fair to themselves, their families, and their children. If they look around them and see that Jews who left Iran 30 years ago are having better life than Jews who left 20 years ago, and Jews who left 10, 20 years ago are better off than Jews who left 10 years ago, the message is that the better they leave Iran, the better. And I think that I don't care that much where they choose to go. I, of, of course, I want them to come to Israel, but I don't care they go anywhere they want. I think that there's no future to Jewish life in Iran under such circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Winston Churchill once said that democracy is the worst form of government except for every other form of government. I think you've seen a wonderful example of democracy in action this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the panel. We're about to start lunch. Half the day is gone. Just wanted to say a quick comment. We started this two years ago in an apartment, in a Sam Yebri's apartment, and we would never imagine this would happen. When we started trying to get support, it was a bunch of young people under 30, no one married, full-time jobs, young professionals, and full-time students. When we tried to get support for this, at the beginning, I remember, the community leaders, would, they laughed at us. They're like, you want us to do this big thing, 1,200 people, you want to fly people, and they didn't think we could do it because we didn't have any real uh, old-time uh, community leaders. They scoffed at us, but we had supporters. And when we look around right now, with this amazing sign and, and the furniture and all the tables, and things are pretty on time. We're only 10, 15 minutes late. But when we look around, I think all of us are very impressed that this is done by young professionals, never done this before, first time. Let's give yourselves a hand. Time. Thank you, thank you. I feel like Obama. Thank you. So, as you guys know, 30 years after is not just about politics. It's about civic action. It's about getting involved. This is just one aspect of it. And just as we were about to say, Hamotzi, just uh, take a, a spiritual thought that as Elul is coming, is here, and Rosh Hashanah is coming up, this is the first time, this is the first time that I can remember, and probably you guys, the old timers, can remember, that so many organizations got together, and this is a true sign that our community is moving forward. We have news stations out here, the magazines were, were talking about this event, on the radio, and so this is true moving forward for our community. And it's not just political action, it's also civic action. We're about to say hamotzi. Please eat. We have to uh, finish dinner at one. I'm sorry, lunch. 1:30. Please get your food. It's going to be a long day. We have a great uh, schedule planned. So, uh, thank you for that. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידש לנו במצב עצמנו על נטילת ידיים ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם המוציא לחם מן הארץ Ladies and gentlemen, there are buffet lines in the foyer to the ballroom we invite you. They are three separate lines. They all have the same food, double sides to each line. As was already announced, 
We ask you to get your food, bring it back to the ballroom, and we will begin promptly at 1.30 with the next panel. At 1.30, panel two, United States developing a political voice in American politics. Once again, there are three separate buffet lines. They all have the same food. <laughs>